But a guy, two guys that I haven't spoken to, I guess it was a year ago, just about right now, in Brooklyn at SummerSlam, and that is Jim Smallman and Glenn Joseph, co-owners of Progress Wrestling. You know, Glenn and Jim, man, welcome back. Thanks Thank for you, coming, sir. man. Thank you very much. What's going on, guys? Hey, Mark. Hey, Mark. Jim's really man. upset that you're not here, by the way. Yeah, I got... Oh, man. What are you talking about? He's right here, guys. <laughs> uh, Hello, it's G- radio. Jim's wearing his Hello. salmon suit, just in case. <laughs> <laughs> it's not tv you don't have to give up the illusion that we're in different rooms guys come on we're british <laughs> this is what we do can i just say when you played when you played my theme music before i genuinely panicked which happens all the time whenever i hear the beginning of whom the bell tolls i think oh no i need to be in the ring shortly <laughs> and think of something i just started say. sweating yeah so it's like the first day of school when you get the jitters and you get that feeling <laughs> yeah. in your gut yeah i just i get it six times in eight days over the course of this week so. yeah very much so yeah so for those who don't know progress wrestling is in the middle of coast to coast they're in the middle right now of their u.s tour they're going to be at laboom in new york city tonight sold out mm. if i'm correct that's correct. right yes we've got, a, we've got a very active twitter at the moment with people going we need to get tickets for tonight so i would advise if anybody doesn't have them you need to be following either myself or jim and we'll try and we'll try and get as many people who you know maybe last minute plans change and stuff but yeah it's going to be it's going to be very exciting at the boom tonight i'm getting a, a dm probably every 10 minutes from someone going so is it sold out i'm like yeah <laughs> sorry um uh, it's, it's not like it's like wrestling sold out yeah. it is sold out yeah, we've, we've, we've prided ourselves in the six and a bit years we've run the company. We've never once kayfabe numbers. <laughs> so when we say, like, if, whenever we tweet in the UK, like, oh, there's 10 tickets left. That means there's 10 tickets left. It doesn't mean normal. Oh, okay. It doesn't mean normal indie wrestling of <laughs> 100, 500 <laughs> yeah. tickets. Um, Guys, I have a question for you. Yeah, Mark. Um, is, is Robbie Brookside's daughter working with y'all? Uh, not at the minute. We know Zaya. Um, and obviously, we know Robbie really well as well. Um, uh, but because um, Zaya's doing, she's doing the Mae Young Classic she's this week. Indeed. So actually, the two girls. Yeah, who, I heard she's doing really, really well. Yeah, she, uh, so herself, Tony Storm, and Ginny, uh, who are also on NXT UK, they, they wrestle for us. So all three of those girls, as well as Isla Dawn, mm. uh, are across. So there's a there's a big UK contingent uh, over on the, the Mae Young Classic who will be rejoining us on the US tour after we uh, uh, after they're done there. And the cool thing about Zyra as well is, because I think she's only maybe 20 years old, but she spent quite a lot of her time since she turned professional in Japan, which I think has obviously helped helped her career, certainly in mm-hmm. terms of her, her sort of coming on in her progression. So Definitely a toughness. Yeah, yeah, it will. If you work places like Stardom, you learn that pretty quick. When you th- talk about being sold out and obviously people are going to be hitting you up for tickets or people could just hang outside a laboom and beat up somebody that has tickets that's always an option too that's the most new york answer anyone's ever given (laughs) welcome to new york (laughs) but you know what i mean it's kind of cool to to do something that you know with even wrestling audiences in the states even though there's a lot of buzz about progress that there's people who aren't aware of the product and to hear sold out when you have a show i mean it's got to be very exciting for you guys yeah to be to be the other, the other side of the world and to to, to know that this there's, there's such a a huge like following over here as well um and how passionate everyone's been i mean like the, what, what always shocks me is that you know we have we have tour t-shirts like you know the, the, the i was there t-shirt basically like in, in every city we go to there's a different branded t-shirt and there's a tour t-shirt and then you get there and you go through like the queue outside and everybody's already wearing a progress t-shirt so which cool. you know when you're watching like 500 600 people there like and also even that's impressive that you're getting that many people considering the 10 years ago particularly in the uk indies you know 150 people was a good draw and now we're doing Wembley, which is 10,000 people. This is it's, amazing. It's, it's, it's the craziest. It, it, also as well, like, I tweeted this the other day. Like, I'm a ring announcer. And I know people know that I, I own the company with Glenn and John. But I'm a ring announcer. And for me to walk into ECW Arena on Saturday and there'll be 1,000 people in ECW Arena and everyone to know I am is crazy. Because we're a company from 3,500 miles away. And everyone knows everything about our storylines everyone knows everything about the people who run the company uh, they know all the crowd chants and stuff like that it's it's crazy to have that level of support for for a company that in my head and i say this all the time in my head is still the same company that started doing shows in front of 300 people um six and a half years ago i i find it insane that people know who we are well i think people have adapted too. I, you know listen 
you wouldn't know from my youthful good looks, but I'm 47 years old. So for years, it's all about whatever's on my TV screen. And sure. if it wasn't, I didn't watch it. Sure. But nowadays, you know, I can go to, you know, progresswrestling.com and you have the streaming service, which is $7.99 a month. Mm -hmm. am, I, am I correct in I saying think in, in US dollars, that will be correct. Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, okay, sorry. <laughs> That's all I know is US dollars. Um, so I can go on there and, and th it's the new world where people are watching it on their computers and not necessarily having to watch it on their TV. Yeah. Well, the, the internet's changed wrestling and with streaming services, they're only going to become more and more prevalent. You yep. only have to look at how many subscribers the WWE Network has to know that like that's that's in my in my opinion i think that's the future of how we're going to to subscribe to and how we're going to like ingest uh, content so um i mean we're, we're, we're very grateful for, to have demand progress and we're very grateful how many subscribers we have and it just goes to show like jim said when people get there they're like oh yeah, i was watching this on my phone on like in the queue outside mm -hmm. like people people getting up to speed with stuff where i was just like <laughs> That's incredible that the, the we can now we have that facility to do that. But it, it also it changes the way that you run companies as well. Is that you have to be transparent with your audience, and I think that's one thing that we've built a lot of trust with our audience, both in the UK uh, and internationally as well, by always being transparent. You know, when somebody gets injured, we we tell them and uh, who's going to be the replacement, or we're going to you know there's, there's there's loads of stuff that we can do in terms of um, being like. A, a family and then uh, literally today is the world premiere of the documentary that was made about us as well oh yeah um i think that's in chicago, chicago. yeah um to have uh, the world premiere of a film that was made in the uk about a uk company in chicago at a film festival so it's cool. just like that's 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 incredible that's the, that's the best that's, make, that's making it y'all <laughs> yeah. y'all experiencing this this growth and this understanding in this country that y'all exist and uh i mean did you ever did you ever think that it would it would get this big? No. No. Like our, our first so the first year and a half, two years of us running, we ran at a loss and we did it because we love wrestling. And the the only goal from when we did our first show was let's see how it goes and maybe we'll do a second show. And then when we booked in a second show, it was like, Okay, maybe we'll do a, a, a second show, the third show and a fourth show and, and then we went from doing shows every three months to every two months, to every month, to every two weeks, uh, and then touring. And, and, you know, this year we've not only we've already been to the USA to do shows in New Orleans over WrestleMania weekend, but we've been to Australia and New Zealand. And and, and, and it we just never anticipated this coming. All we wanted to do, our, our goal has never been, we've never had like a some kind of crazy business plan, like let's take over the universe. It's never been that. It's just, hey, can we put on wrestling shows that as fans we'd like, and then we send fans home happy? And then maybe they want to buy a ticket to the next one. That's all we've ever done, and we still run by that principle now. We don't, you know, we don't think about scary things like business stuff. We just think, hey, how can we make people want to watch what we do? That's that's kind of like an old school philosophy mm -hmm. into what you're doing right now. You know what I think is so cool about what we're doing right here is that, you know, your progress wrestling, and for the most part, you know, progress wrestling is something that I watch on the internet and I read about. You know, mm -hmm. like Fighting Spirit magazine, I subscribe. Which is a pain in the ass, by the way. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> and it cost me a hell of a lot of money to do it. But, you know, I, I listen, I, I, it's, I, I'm, I'm in the know about progress because of that. Uh, but that we're doing this show on Sirius XM and, you know, it's Mark Henry, WWE Hall of Famer, who's hosting this show. And we're talking about progress wrestling. Like, if that doesn't scream 2018, yeah. I don't know what does. It, and that's the, the really quick like when um glenn told me we were doing this interview i was like this is my life's weird now <laughs> like to get to do an interview with you guys is is odd for me like i i and and every year last year we'd cool stuff would happen and we'd go oh 2017 isn't it and now the 2018 is just as crazy like the the crazy stuff that's happened this year already yeah. is, we, we, is, we've kind of we've broken wrestling in the best way possible yeah. Now, when you look at like, and even I'm talking to, to Gabe Sapolsky the other day when he was like, oh, you know, when we, when we had Adam Cole wrestle for us, and I was like, oh, yeah, against w Walter, who's like right one of the, the biggest indie stars in the world right now, and Adam Cole, who is WWE contracted, and he's wrestling in that venue in Boston for the North American title on an indie show, and we're going like, this just would not have happened that five years ago. It's a completely new world. And I think also that one of the reasons that maybe we've we've had uh, a, a modicum of success is that we don't come from the wrestling industry, we come from the entertainment industry. And there's a certain way that uh, we expected, Jim is a, a, a comedian, myself as an actor, that we expected to be treated when we were in our respective industries by mm -hmm. producers, by directors, by writers, whoever. We try and carry that same ethos into the excuse because wrestling 
doesn't work anymore. Everything has to be at a certain standard, from the rings to the to the to the crew to to how you know whether there's you know catering available or mm. drinks available backstage, or even just making sure that the talent actually feel appreciated rather than just like I'm I'm lucky for a booking because that's that's yeah. just not these are highly skilled you know athletes and performers who should be respected for that in the same way that we we used to feel i'm sure you've done plenty of gigs where you were just like yep just saying the words and thinking of the money yeah most of the last four years of my stand-up because <laughs> i've quit now so because now now wrestling's my full-time full-time job because progress has been successful it's that's it's awesome a, it's a relief that's, that's awesome <laughs> well as as um as william regal will tell people i wasn't funny anyway so it doesn't really matter <laughs> yeah <laughs> Well, you know, it, it's kind of, it's kind of like what we're talking about with me. You know, I've I've always had multiple jobs, but now my full time job is hosting a wrestling show on Sirius greatest. XM five five days a week. Yeah, which is crazy because you would never think you would never have thought ten years ago that you would be able to even talk wrestling five days a week for three hours, mm-hmm. but. But now you can because not just because of WWE, because of progress and Ring of Honor and even the NWA. We had Billy Corgan in studio last week, mm. sitting right where you are. And um, the fact that he's now owns that brand NWA and that NWA title is going to be defended in Chicago in front of a sold out crowd of 10,000 fans. If you would have told me that two years ago, mm. it would have been like, have you seen the NWA title <laughs> defended? Like, it's usually in front of 50 people, but now it's going to be in front of 10,000. This is also proof that um, something weird has happened and we all live in the Matrix in that the lead singer of the Smashing Pumpkins owns the NWA. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, like, like it sounds like a dream almost. If you, if you take me back to like 21-year-old me at university and you told me that was what had happened in the future, as well as the fact that I'd be a wrestling promoter, um, I would have gone, okay, don't be silly. Maybe stop drinking. Yeah. Um, but that's the world we live in now. It's It's... I, I I met my wife like after we'd done the first progress show, and I remember sort of at the time saying to her, "Look, stand up's going to be my job, and I'm going to I'm going to make an okay living out of that, and, and wrestling's always going to be a hobby." And the minute it became obvious that I could pursue it as a, an actual full time job, mm-hmm. she was the one who was like, "You you need to do it." And it's, it, the good thing about working with my two best friends as well is is we all we're all going to look after each other and make sure that that we are able to do this for as long as possible. It might not last forever. You know, wrestling's always got boom and bust periods. And at the minute, certainly in the UK, we're super lucky that there's not just us, there's loads of very good companies in the UK all doing cool things and we've got a really, really hot scene. For a, a country that's roughly the size of Florida and has 60 million people in it, to have that many talented wrestlers at our disposal and so many places that the boys can work is... It's insane if you think about it. Yeah, selling out midweek shows was a, was a thing for me as well, where it went from being like uh, majority of wrestling's always done the, the weekend unless it's camps so or Friday Saturday night. We've always run Sunday afternoon, mm. um, and then we started like midweek shows on, on Wednesdays. And the fact that now we we're, we're so busy with the other shows as well. Uh, another company who we work with, Attack Pro Wrestling, who are based in in Wales. Now they've come across to take over those midweek shows, and I'm sure they're going to sell out those as well. When we first started this six years ago. The the phrase you can't run wrestling in central London was was the phrase. It's kind of like you can't. I would imagine you can't run wrestling in New York City. You can. You just have to be really careful about how you grow the company. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's one thing that we've been quite lucky with. And again, like like Jim says, like Jim and John are legitimately my best friends. So we want to work for each other to make sure that this brand like, carries on for, for as long as feasibly possible. You know, for for you, Glenn, and for you, Jim, like you said, this is now your 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 gig this mm-hmm. is your full-time job when did you finally realize the both of you when did you finally realize like wow this is something i can do and make a living off of it well i i i, I was on my last tour and but uh, i'd like I, the, the boys take the mickey out of me because my knees are worse than theirs but it's just from landing on i did musical theater for 10 years and jumping off drum drum rises onto my knees and what have you like i they're they're not how they worked i'm not the sprightly 21 year old i used to be i know you can't tell by my you know as a difference already my <laughs> my boy look, my boyish you still look young boyish good looks <laughs> unless i take my beard off and my face explodes um <laughs> it does it when you shave you instantly gain six stone in yeah. your face it's the best um <laughs> So uh, on that last tour, uh, we it was like having two full time jobs, and I think that well, well, at one point we went, you know what? If we d- devote all of our time to this, and if we actually put as much energy in as possible to make this as, as big as it can be, we were kind of we weren't. It's not like we were disrespecting progress while we had other jobs. It was just we can do this as a full time job, and also 
what's interesting is so many of the guys in Brit- um, in Britain now are full-time wrestlers as well. I would say that 75% of our roster are full-time independent professional wow. wrestlers. I know the old adage of, even Jim Cornette said it recently, you know, well, the top guys aren't making as much money as they used to. No, but everybody else is making more money than they used to. Across the board, the pro wrestling scene, the business, is making more money than I think it ever has before for individual people that we are actually looking after our own much better than we used to and you don't have to have a huge contract to do that you can actually have as you know chris brooks has alluded to in the past you can have creative control you can have kind of like you can have more freedom to do what you want like the austin the matt cross is another example mm. whenever matt comes over to america he's super uh, across to the uk rather he's super excited to be there and it's because this is all on his terms he travels when he wants and goes if he wants a day off he can have a day off, you know, unless he's booked, and then he's just, you know, a jerk for not showing up. <laughs> um, but it's it's really, really interesting to see these guys now who are going, I've had a desk job for 15 years, and now I'm going to give it a go. And now some of these guys, like NXT UK as an example, are getting signed. Like, they're, they're getting deals yep. because they took that leap of faith. And sometimes, you know, he who dares wins. Well, look, at Eddie Dennis is one of the best examples, and there's a really good um, little mini documentary. If you go on YouTube and just search Eddie Dennis, you'll find it. Um, shot by a photographer called James Musselwhite. And this focuses on the fact that Eddie was legitimately the youngest school principal in the United Kingdom. Um, You know, that was his job. He was a really well-respected teacher in a private school, and he quit that to become a full-time professional wrestler like most of his friends. I think Eddie's a little bit older than guys like Pete Dunne and Mark Andrews who he broke in with. And for him to take that leap of faith shows you that you know, I had to do the same thing. I had a I had a real job, and then I quit that to do stand up comedy. And I had to go from earning money that meant I could pay all my bills to taking a leap of faith and being poor for a bit. And often that is the the transition that people had to do. I had to do a little bit when I stopped comedy. Um, but but the fact that people can do it. You look at our first ever show, Chapter One. I don't think anyone on that show was full time. Uh, if they were full time, it was because they were young and they still lived at home and they just didn't have another job. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but now if you look at, I think nearly everybody who works for us is, is getting, certainly everybody who's here with us in the States. Yes. And, and, and that felt like a pipe dream when we started six and a half years ago. Just nobody was, nobody was earning that sort of money. It's, and everyone's got their, you look at, um, how much the talent are selling their merch while they've been here as well. Like people are excited to buy merch. People's merch game is better, but everyone has, as everyone feels like they put so much work into every aspect of what they do on the indies now. So, you know, they've got their branding right. They they get good merch design. They get good gear so they look good in the ring. They, everyone feels like they're working so hard. You know, whether it is the goal is to be signed by WWE or the goal is to go to Japan or the goal is to go to Mexico um, or the goal is just to stay on the indies and just make money that way. Everybody feels like they've got a goal now and there are... The, the goals are attainable. It's not just that you have to be in the right place at the right time and have the right person like you anymore. It's not, you know, everybody can make a success out of this. It, do you have a lot of, do you show a lot of, have a lot of value in uh, what was going on at NXT? Um, in, in what regard, uh, Mark? In regard of the talent that's out there now and, and people that are, uh, have, have been through NXT and, um, experiences that y'all might have had with nxt well i mean we've obviously we've got a, a pretty friendly relationship with wwe and uh so most recent example of this will probably be when we we do a three-day tournament um every year uh called super strong style 16 which is one of my favorite things that we do uh and this year we had uh, cassius ono part of it which again was wwe allowing him to be loaned to us but obviously when cassius was still chris hero on the indies he worked for us Tommaso Ciampa worked extensively for us. In, had his in last the indie UK, match for us. Had his last indie match for us. Alistair Black had his last indie match for us. Uh, Jack Gallagher had his last indie match for us. Finn Balor. Finn Balor had his last indie match for us. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, we, you know, and the, the few times, you know, we've, from, we've been to the PC a couple of times and like we, we walk into the PC and the fact that we know nearly everybody there because either people have worked for us or they were at a point where they wanted to work for us right before they got signed. Like it's it's insane, and and as a as a fan, like I get so excited about watching NXT all the time. You know, I, I, I every single takeover show I look forward to. We were at Takeover in New Orleans, and and we'll be at Takeover in Brooklyn, and 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 those shows blow us away every single time. And and part of it is like every time there's a takeover, I'll work out the percentage of wrestlers on the card who've wrestled at least one match for progress. And I think in the last takeover, it was something like sixty-two percent or something like that. It wrestled wow, yeah. at least once for us, and wow. that's amazing. And that's amazing because, you know, I think 
NXT is so good at being the, the bridging product between independent wrestling and main roster WWE, and it's such an exciting... It, it feels like it's a brand that was designed with me in mind. All my wrestling sensibilities feel like they're captured within NXT. Yeah, very, very much so. I, Gentleman Jack is, is one of my favorites. <laughs> he had his last indie match with us. Yeah, he's a... <laughs> <laughs> I, was try, I'm, I'm trying, I was trying to get Jack to uh, take on this... Uh, uh, Les Kellett performance. Oh, like yeah. Like this persona. Uh, I grew up, you know, a wrestling fan, as most people know. Mm. But the once I got to Louisville, I got to go into Jimmy Carnett's archive. Right. And uh, so I was able to, you know, know who Les Kellett was. And that's and- mind-blowing for me that you know who Les Kellett is because we always, I think we British people have a very sort of, um, insular idea that w- things like World of Sport, we're the only people who really know about them, and then maybe, but knowing Mark that you know Les Kellett is and you were a fan of Les Kellett, that's that's something really cool. But can you imagine seeing Jack do that <laughs> drunk gimmick? Yes, <laughs> like um, he could do it. As he could do it. I, oh my God, I want to do. I want him to do it just for me. I don't care about nobody else. Well, incidentally, Ed, Mark, we have met before in the hotel lobby of the um, the hotel we stayed in Brooklyn. And we had this exact same conversation <laughs> where you, because st- I remember going, Mark Henry really likes Les Kellett, and that's really mind blowing. So I'm glad, Jim, that you've got to share the same excitement that I had a year ago. Well, I think, I think, because cause Jack's a good friend of mine. Uh, I went to his, his wedding last year and stuff like that, and I, I get on really well with Jack. So I think now, if we can work on it on every possible side, so if Mark works on it from his side, mm-hmm. I work at it from my side, mm-hmm. then we can, we can get, we can get Jack on board with this. He'd be so up for that as well. I'm yeah, sure he would. Very much oh, so. my God. We got to get it, man. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm talking about all of you fans that don't know who Les Kellett is, please Google Les Kellett. Uh, he was an English wrestler during the time of the Thames, like uh, uh, Benny Hill. Uh, fam- like, you know, real classically trained um, entertainers. They did comedy. They did... Um, it was the days of variety, wasn't it? The, the variety shows, and uh, there's another show called Benny Hill, who you got to watch <laughs> this show. But um, you know, I grew up in a time where you know Benny Hill was like one of the top uh, late night shows that came on, and um, he and Les Kellett were friends apparently, and studied together, I guess, in the arts, and. Les Kellett was was a tough guy too, from what I understand. There's um there's um, a book called uh, The Wrestling by uh, Simon Garfield, I think, um and there's there's a lot about Les Kellett in there because he's obsessed with the old world of sport wrestling, and he talks about um Les Kellett was a, apparently a pig farmer, um as well as being a professional wrestler, and he was known for being both really really funny, but outside the ring one of the toughest human beings in the world. Um, uh, and and I know like that sort of variety style because I know someone that William Regal talks about all the time is Cyanide Sid Cooper, who was a similar sort of uh, similar sort of entertainer of that in that regard, um, but obviously a villain rather than a, a, a babyface. But I think I think everyone should definitely work on Jack. Like ev- <laughs> everybody, now you've brought this up, Mark. I'm going to make sure that that we make this happen in some way. Oh, it we're going to make it happen. <laughs> we're working together, guys. We're all on the same team. It's and for our, it's for our good, and it's for everybody else's. Y'all will thank us later. <laughs> Interestingly enough, like the conversation I often have with Mister Regal when talking to younger wrestlers is, you don't necessarily have to watch what's around now. It's mm-hmm. about watching where it came from, and also it's mm-hmm. about watching stuff like Variety. Like I've I've probably learned more about wrestling from watching Morecambe and Wise than I have done watching like you know something that happened in 2016. Not to say that it's wrong, it's just because it it's just different. Robbie Brookside is constantly telling people always think about ways to be different. It's what about separates yeah. you from the pack. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned Louisville there a second ago, Mark. And this is what's really interesting about the where we are in the world of uh, the word developmental. Now used to mean. It used to mean rather getting signed to a developmental deal. It used to be about developing what you are. I I personally have the opinion now that places like the Performance Center are finishing school. If you ask the, the bruiserweight Pete Dunn, he says my developmental was on the indies. That's where I learned to play, and that's where I could you know go in front of a hundred kids and know how how do I work an eleven year old, and then you can go in front of a smart crowd and be like, 
how do I work this 35 year old man who lives in his basement? And then you go to, um, you go to, uh, the, the PC and then it's like, well now how do I refine that to become a television character? How do I, for the future yeah. NXT UK, NXT, then thinking about Raw and SmackDown, how do you become like a, a marketable commodity in what is still the show business world? So, developmental now i think and if you look at the amount of people keith lee i watched his you know his, his, a promo from him yesterday yeah. and it was like it was straight from keith lee that we know who mm-hmm. wrestled, was wrestling for us like uh, six weeks ago yep. is the same keith lee now that because he was so refined and he spent so long learning what works for him and what his character was and what have you by the time he's made it to to what we used to be known as developmental now is known as nxt i mean he's good to go and that's really interesting now to see that never used to happen. It used to be somebody would disappear for a few months, and then all of a sudden it'd be like, "Hey, look, here's this new version of CM Punk." Well, he's he's going well, he's going from signing to debut because he, he debuts next week on NXT, right? So he's gone from signing yeah. to debut in super quick. But it's because he's worked for us for a, a, a couple of years, yeah, maybe, a few years, yeah. And um, we love Keith, and to see him like in that position so quickly is is great. But he, I, I've never seen him have a bad match. I've only ever seen him do great stuff. Mm. You mentioned before about. You know, come WrestleMania, you'll be in Brooklyn to see NXT. Mm-hmm. That at that same time, that same night, uh, there's going to be a G1 special at Madison Square Garden with New Japan and Ring of Honor. Mm-hmm. And and for us here, you know, Mark and I talked about. We're actually on Chris Jericho's podcast, Talk Is Jericho, to talk about wrestling at Madison Square Garden. We never ever thought that there would be a day where somebody outside the WWE would be playing the garden. And the fact that we're getting, you know, New Japan and Ring of Honor at Madison Square Garden is a big deal. Talk about, you know, progress wrestling being at Wembley, at Wembley Arena. (laughs) So this is something that people don't realize is, so we do one big show a year. So our normal shows, we get 700, 800 people, which is for an indie company, we, we, there's no reason to be blase about it for an indie company that's still a big deal mm-hmm. 700 800 people i think we have 500 people in new york tonight sold out like the 700 800 people every month is is huge and our show sell out super quick and which we used to be as well it used to be just london now it's yeah. london birmingham sheffield manchester, manchester. Yeah. so now it's like it's a a, a a nationwide brand yeah and so but then it's a big so we do one big show a year it's normally in september and we we did one a couple of years ago. We got two and a half thousand to, and uh, around that time we were we were offered the chance to use Wembley Arena, and we said no because we didn't think that we could. Uh, and here's the thing: it holds ten thousand people. We're not necessarily expecting to get ten thousand people there because it's it's like all arenas; it's modular. You can make yeah, it, you yeah. can make it work out how it needs to. Um, but we're already at a point where the show is easily our biggest show ever by a long way, and it's already going to look amazing for British indie wrestling, how many people we're going to have in Wembley Arena. The fact that we're even allowed to wrestle there, it, it, it's not... Wembley Arena's not quite uh, the UK's answer to Madison Square Garden, because I don't think we really have an answer to Madison Square Garden. Madison Square Garden's such a sort of mecca for professional wrestling. Mm. Um, but the fact that, that we were even offered the opportunity to use it, and they came to us. We didn't yeah. ask them. Like, Wembley Arena came to us and said, hey, do you, do you want to do a show? And we were like... Oh, oh, Okay, um, <laughs> I, I, I mean, let us, uh, yes. <laughs> let us let us let us do some maths and work out work out how, how likely we are to bankrupt the company doing it, and then we worked it out and was like, okay, and we took a leap of faith. And don't get me wrong, the first couple of months of the tickets being on sale is probably the most nervous I've ever been about the future of our company. And then I very quickly relaxed again because things are going to be fine. Yeah, um, and and everything we're doing at the minute, even the stuff we're doing in the states, because I, I said this in the ring the other day. Like we've not bought these shows to America. We're not. We don't do house shows. So every show we're doing, we've already had a title switch while we've been here. Like every show that we're doing has a a point and has um uh, has an end goal. Kind of at Wem- the Wembley shows are WrestleMania. Like there's there's two guys and I forget their real names. I know their Twitter names. I think. Um and there's two guys who are coming to every single one of our six shows in the US this week. Wow. Now, now bearing in mind, I'd get it if they were all in the similar sort of <laughs> geographical area. But on, the the sa- on, on the same coast. Yeah. Even. The one on Thursday is in Seattle. So like they they've already done uh, Philly and Boston, they're doing New York tonight, they're doing Seattle on Thursday, they're doing Chicago on Saturday, Detroit on Sunday. Jeez. And and they're coming to Wembley Arena as well. And these are two American dudes who who've been to see every show we've done in the USA so far. And that level of support is crazy and already knowing that i think there's at least a couple of hundred people coming from the states to come to wembley to see our show is it means that we are presenting it like a wrestlemania and that, and that is even though in our, our much smaller world than wwe mm. like to be able to do that and to be able to do that 
kind of using our own roster as well. We're trying to base that show around our roster, not going crazy with imports and stuff like that, which is often how British wrestling was built. You would you'd have one or two big imports that you'd sell photographs with and that's how you funded the show but we've never run like that we've always tried to base it around our storylines and our uh, and our talent and it's yeah it's a, it's a crazy thing to be able to do will i be able here living in new jersey will i be able to watch this show from wembley you'll be able to watch it about a week later like all of our shows okay. on on demand-progress.com because um it, we we often get asked about doing pay-per-view and stuff like that because I know that like our friends with WWN they, most of the Evolve shows are on pay-per-view for example um, but doing pay-per-view from, uh, from an independent company standpoint in the UK we don't have the infrastructure it's really hard to do it and get it right and not have it dropping out on you and I don't yeah. want loads of people to sign up for it and then it drop out I'd rather we do the show we concentrate on the thousands of people who are coming to that show uh, and then we edit it and make it look really cool and let the rest of the world see it a few days later which is how we've how we've done the, the it so far and i know it's hard avoiding spoilers that's the, the biggest complaint we get as a company is is things being spoiled when we put photos up and stuff like that but hopefully hopefully we'll be able to we'll be able to warn people off that a little bit so you're you good programming you'll wait <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. You'll wait. You'll wait for good program. That's, that's absolutely true, and they got a good program. You're at Laboom tonight in Queens. You're at Washington Hall in Seattle, as you said on Thursday, and then August 11th, you're in Chicago, and then August 12th, you're in Detroit, and you're all over the place. This is amazing. And then we die of exhaustion. Yeah. So, yeah. well, the um, if anybody is thinking, and they are, you know, uh, uh, available to to travel to Detroit and Chicago. Seattle um, is looking really good at the moment. Detroit and Chicago, everyone, everything's looking great. Everything is at that kind of like that moment where you go, if you if you thinking it's going to be available on the door, which I know is like this is a very US thing as well, and so we always kind of urge when we come people to go, when we come over here, that whole I'll just get walk up tickets, I'll just get there. We've had already, and particularly like tonight, if you look at La Boom, you know you can't just like walk up now to a progress show. It's kind of like. Um, we urge everybody, and you can go to progresswrestling.com if you need links to the tickets, of course. But we get ahead of, did, like I said, Seattle, Detroit, Chicago. Ch- and Chicago's the one you've got the most chance of getting a ticket for because Detroit sold out and then we found more tickets. Yeah. Um, but I think there's only maybe like 20 tickets left for Detroit. Seattle, uh, all the shows we've been doing uh, have been with WWN apart from the show in Seattle, which is with our friends at Defy. Um, and we've got a show on Thursday. Defy have a show on Friday. And I know a lot of people are coming up. Uh, are coming up some around the an Pacific early weekend for, for for sort of both days because um, some of our talent is on the Defy show on the Friday as well, um, but um, but yeah, Chicago is the one that you've got the most chance of getting a ticket for. Partly because it's I think it's the biggest venue we're using while yeah. we're here. Um, but yeah, even like the other day when we walked out ECW Arena, I was like, ah, oh, no one's going to know who we are. And and the start of the show, we had a duel in This Is Progress, an ECW chant, and twenty uh, year old me. I'm forty now. Twenty year old me just inside me just went this is the coolest thing you'll ever do <laughs> Good you, for you will never do anything this cool I, I have a smile on my face most of the time because my job is really cool i'll be the same tonight when the, the lovely people of new york make me feel as welcome as they did when we did the show um in queens last year at the encore center you know when when the fans were chanting please come back before the show had started yeah and wouldn't let me talk that's that's exactly what i was it's thinking of the best that, that happened a year ago <laughs> and when we had the new york show and we were like that that's pretty incredible the, you know the first show that we run outside of wrestlemania season and then to be in the DCW arena and before Jim had even said anything to get a please come back chant is just, that's like, it's not even like on, on, on a list of things I would ever hope to happen. It's far above and beyond. We've been, we've been made to feel incredibly welcome, incredibly valued. And I hope that we make our fan base feel valued as well with the quality of, of shows that we're putting on. 